turning me up a little, I'll shout louder and uh, give you a couple of uh, informational things. One is, uh, many of you are asking, what are the little red cards? I've got little plastic cards there, all a dollar. If you want any of those, the red ones that say spiritual warfare card at the top have the same verses on them as the stakes. And after the, the story happened about the stakes in the trunk, I said, I need some way more portable to, uh, to hide God's Word around people that we know walking Thank away you. from God. So these also have a quote from the verse. So I like these because they're small. You can put them in your phone case. It's easier to stake your hotel room uh, that way. You can hide them in baseboards. You can hide them in books in people's houses and they never look. You can tape them under the desks of kids at school. They never misuse some duct tape. They'll never know. i got some unbelievable stories uh, about that. We'll talk more of that. You'll hear some of those stories as we go through the slides. Then... Uh, also, some of you didn't know what these different stickers are. We have red stickers and black stickers. The black stickers are called scripture stickers. They're an issue like racial unity or the word Jesus or children. And then there's verses about God you know, wanting our children to be protected. Verses about the Jesus name being powerful. Um, one of the fun ones to share on that, this one on self-discipline. I had a young lady from Nashville call me one day. And she said, oh, Mr. Hemphill, she said, I loved your teaching of the strategic placement of God's Word around people. I loved how she worded that. The strategic placement of God's Word around people. She said, the first thing I thought of was my best friend was trying to lose 15 pounds. And she'd been trying for three years and no diet worked for her. In fact, she was gaining weight. And so finally, I looked up some verses on self-discipline. And I took them and wrote them with a, with a, a magic marker on a piece of duct tape. And I took that duct tape to her house, and when she wasn't looking, I stuck them on the bottom of her bathroom scales. <laughs> Who looks on the bottom of their bathroom scales to check and see if somebody has sabotaged it? I mean, I don't know anybody that does. And three weeks later, this friend of hers called and said, guess what? I've lost 15 pounds. And she said, well, look on the bottom of your bathroom scales. God's Word is powerful. And every time I tell that story, I sell out of self-discipline scales. <laughs> Uh, also, there's, a, there's one that's off to the side, and it quotes Deuteronomy uh, 8, verse 4. It says, these past 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out and your feet did not sweat. You know, when they were in the desert, God took care of them. They didn't have to buy any new shoes because He made the shoes last. So, uh, the red words say, God makes things last by the power of His Word. So, I, I, th these are $5 for five stickers, and you peel a stick, and they're bumper sticker material, so they're real thick and durable. But I put that on everything I need to last. I put it on my air conditioner. I put it on my heater. I put it on my computer. I've got an air conditioner that's supposed to last 12 years. It's in its 37th year. So it's just God can make things last by the power of His Word. There's also red ones back there that we call statement stickers. And they make a statement based on what the Scripture says. Like, no abortion spirit may stay. No gluttony spirit may stay. No slander spirit may stay. No homosexual spirit may stay. You're expelling the spirits that are the problem. So you can use the stickers on the stakes. They fit on the stakes, but you can also put them on a door frame. You can hide them around people. You can put them under your car hood, you know, or under somebody else's car hood, whatever is appropriate. The other thing, I don't have very many of these with me. Uh, I need to get some more from my brother. But my brother is a comedian. He's a preacher in uh, Arkansas now. But uh, we grew up together, and... Uh, he has been writing for a Texas fishing game and several other Deer Country newspapers for a long time. And so just to share with you the, uh, the wit of my brother, we're going to have a little laugh as I start my, uh, my presentation. I'm going to read you the dedication for this book. And it's a collection of funny stories about hunting and fishing called The Book Never Got Here. <laughs> Only hunters understand this, this really uh, complicated title. This book is dedicated to my wife, Jocelyn, who has borne my children, carried out my trash, cooked my meals, washed my clothes, ironed my shirts, cleaned my house, corrected my mistakes, screened my calls, folded my laundry, tolerated my friends, paddled my canoe, cut my hair, processed my dead game, patted my back, mopped up my spills, and put up with me in a million other ways during the 24 plus years we've been married. 
If she ever leaves me, I plan to go with her. Okay. I'll leave that book. Okay. Okay, you can have it. It's right here. All right. Let's see if my... Okay, we're going to talk about demons, and we're going to talk about symbols. And I won't go quite as long as I did last night. I will leave some time for question and answers, and I'll hang around for any private questions and answers. And then we'll pick up again tomorrow night. Demons and symbols. The first thing I want to do is share... Let's see. I have to turn it on before it works. I want to share a story with you that is a very uh, pointed story to illustrate a very important modern-day truth. Satan is targeting the children in Christian homes. If he can get the children in Christian homes, he can wipe the church out in just one generation. So I'm learning more and more that that's the case. This is a story that happened. I was in North Texas for a leadership conference. I was one of like three speakers. I spoke on spiritual warfare. It was a long morning thing. And then uh, I gave the lesson you heard earlier, basically just one lesson, and then it was over with two other speakers. And then I was hanging around my book table answering questions and selling books. I was, I'm, I'm kind of a one-man <laughs> operation. And um, one tall, real tall guy had his arms crossed standing there. He was looking over the top. He was much taller than everybody else. He was just meeting my eyes. And I looked at him and I said, do you need to talk to me? And he said, yes, privately when you finish. So I said, well, just hang around. Well, 30 minutes later, everybody's gone. Me and him sat down. And he said, we got three kids and uh, we homeschool." And I've been through some difficult financial problems, but I have a good job now, and we're working through that. And uh, I'm more worried about my oldest daughter, Emma. She's 10. But three years ago, when Emma was only 7, she started to have a personality change, and she quit doing her work, and she was talking back and saying very ugly things, very out of character for her. And I said, well, what kind of ugly things? He said, well, she might say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt you. I'm going to cut you with a knife and make you bleed. I'm going to kill you. She'd say it to her brother or sister or to her parents. And he said, we homeschool. She's not getting this at school. And she never gets on the internet. You know, and we don't watch TV. So I, but we knew she was repeating this because she'd heard it from someone else. So we sat down and we kept thinking, you know, where do you hear this? Where do you hear this? She wouldn't tell us. She'd just clam up. So finally one day, we sat down and said, Emma, we're not getting up until you tell us where you heard those words. We know you didn't come up with that on your own. Who said it? And she finally told him. She said, I heard it from Legba. L-E-G-B-A. And they said, well, who's Legba? She said, I don't know, Daddy. He's the one that comes every night and sits at the foot of my bed and watches me while I sleep. Christian family active in church. <laughs> Well, they were scared to tell anybody. People are going to think our daughter's crazy or something. But it sounds like a demon. So it got worse. Her attitude got worse. Her schoolwork got worse. So finally, uh, they went to the preacher. And they said, we need to talk to you, but we need you to promise you can't tell anyone unless we say okay. He said, okay, I won't. What, what is it? And they told him the whole story. And he had read my book, What Are the Stakes? So he knew I had some ideas that were helpful to other people. He said, well... Steve Hemphill might be somebody we call someday, but for now, would you like me to go and pray with him? And they said, that'd be great. And so this guy's sitting here now telling me the story. He said, that was three years ago, and when he came and prayed with Emma, uh, things were better. She got a lot better. So we were very encouraged. But it didn't go away completely. And sometimes it comes back, and sometimes it's worse than others. Most of the time it's pretty good. And he said, I love the idea of the staking of the property, but I just, I just don't have $15. I've had this financial problem. And I said, hey, then let me give you some free ones. Anybody that can't afford them, I always give them free. This has never been about money. So I gave him the instruction sheet, and I gave him four stakes. And I said, let me know how it goes. So I drive five hours home the next day, on, on, on uh, Sunday evening. And that night, I dreamed about Emma. Now, I'm going to talk about dreams later in the weapons section. But I had never done that before. And in the dream... I, I called the dad and said, you need to ask him of these questions. There were three questions. So the next day, I called him right about noon. I got finished going to the bank and post office and catching up with emails and stuff. And it, I looked and said, oh, it's noon. I need to call him. So I called right at noon. And he was coming home to eat lunch to save money, eat cheaper. So he, 
he walked in the door and the phone's ringing and he picks up the phone. And I said, hey, this is Steve. You know, this may sound crazy, but, you know, my life's crazy anyway. Uh, I think God wants you to ask Emma these three questions. Please write these down. So he did. Did Legba touch her? Did Legba give her anything? Did Legba introduce her to anyone? That was the three questions. So he, he wrote them down. He said, okay, we homeschool. She's right here. I'll call you back in five minutes. And he did. And he said, she never touched him. And she never gave him anything. But when we said, Emma, did he introduce you to anyone? And she said, well, yes, Daddy. He introduced me to all his friends. Well, if he's a demon, guess what they are? And they said, well, do you remember three years ago when this first started and the preacher came over and prayed with you about this? She said, oh yeah, I remember that. And, and after that, he couldn't talk. He still came every night. He sat at the foot of my bed. He watched me while I slept, but he couldn't talk. They bound him in Jesus' name, but they didn't cast him out in Jesus' name. Your words are powerful. And so uh, he's telling me this, this whole thing. He, he also said, well, uh, did he ever leave? She said, yes, he finally left. Because one night I realized he was getting mad because he couldn't talk to me anymore. So I started looking at my sister in the other bed. And I realized he was going to start talking to my sister. And that's when I sat up and I said, no, you leave my sister alone. It's time for you to go. You go now. That's when he finally left when the little girl told him to go. Wow. And then uh, she said, also, Daddy, he invited me to go with him sometime to Funland. Funland? Emma, what's Funland? She said, I don't know. We never went, Daddy. But he made it sound like it was an amusement park. And when he said that, I said, oh, okay, write this down. There's one more question. I can't explain how I knew this question except that the Holy Spirit whispers stuff to us now and then, you know. And I said, write this down. Ask her if there's a magic word or secret way she can always go to Funland if she wants to. See, I was sensing that, that Satan wants this back door into her life. And if you just, this little word, hey, how about Funland? Remember Funland? I told you about Funland a long time ago. It's always a way back in. It's a connection to that time when he had a connection to her. That's what I thought was happening. And said, he said, okay, we'll ask her. So they sat her down and said, Emma, is there a magic word or secret way you can always go to Funland if you want to? When they asked that little 10-year-old girl that question, she just started shaking and looking at the floor. And she was just dead silent. And they said, we're going to sit here until you tell us. She was just shaking, and finally, finally she looked up and she said, Yes, Daddy, but I'm not allowed to tell you that. Why would a 10-year-old girl tell her own parents she's not allowed right. to tell? Because he threatens something. Right. I'm going to hurt you if you reveal. I'm going to hurt your parents. I'm going to hurt your sister. I'm going to kill you. See, those are the words she learned from him in the first place. I'm going to kill you. See? Right. And so... Um, I said, well, explain to her, you're a Christian, and if you're a Christian and you're a baptized believer, you have the Holy Spirit. Read Acts 2.38, and that's the defense you need against the enemy's offense, and you're safe. They can't hurt you. I was trying to get her to feel okay, and they did. And a few weeks later, she was baptized, and she's fine. The problems are all gone and went away. But it made me realize that Satan is targeting the children in Christian homes. And I've seen it over and over and over again. Uh, that is one of the... Uh, can't really read the number. The screen doesn't exactly fit, but there's a... Can you say, tell me the, what's the number of the podcast on that battle plan? Bottom right-hand corner. 48. 48. Podcast number 48 of battle plan. If you like the podcast, that story is number 48 on battle plan. Okay. So, Colossians 1 teaches us that in the unseen realm, there are thrones, kingdoms, rulers and authorities. That implies territorial limits and authority over a designated area. But with that in mind, I started to make a list of the demons named in the Bible. Now, if you want to take a picture of this, get your camera out. You can zoom in the best you can. There's two pages. They're in alphabetical order, A to Z. And you're going to see three columns. The name of the demon on the left, the Bible verse on the right, and in the middle, you're going to see a column of the territory the Bible says that demon is in charge of. Okay? So here they are in alphabetical order. Adramelech, Ammon, Anamelech, Asherah, Ashima, Baal, Beelzebub, Baal, Bareth, Chemosh, Dagon, Kawan, Marduk, Marduk, Molech, Nargel, Nibhaz, Nisroch, Queen of Heaven, Rephon, Remanon, Sekoth, Spirit Prince of Persia, Spirit Prince of Greece, Sekoth, Beneth, and Tartak. Okay, that's one of, yeah, here's back up one again, it starts with the A's. Uh, that is 
the, the list I've found so far. You may find some. I haven't. But there was a real surprise to me that that many demons were named in the Bible. But the bigger surprise to me was notice there's no blanks in the middle. Every demon has an assignment. Which makes sense of Jude verse 9. Some angels left the territories the Lord put them in and disobeyed. Go read Jude. And you'll find that verse. I don't think I put it right here. But every demon had a territory, a city or a region or a nation. So I thought, okay, so there's a demonic chain of command. We know Satan is the god of this world. He's called in Scripture the god of this world. And so uh, since every demon has a territory, it makes sense that every territory has a demon. So there's a demon of the church here. There's a demon of the city here. There's authorities. There's principalities, powers, spirits, and authorities. And also that agrees with what Scripture talks about angels. To the angel of the church at Smyrna, right this, to the angel of the church, there's angels over churches and over cities and there's demons over, and there's a battle going on. Who, who's the battle over? Us. And the battle is over where we will spend eternity. Once you understand your enemy is not the person who's treating you like dirt. It's not even the person who divorced you and left, even though that wasn't the right thing to do. It's not the person who cussed you out. It's not the person who mistreated you. It's not the person, it's not the preacher who was mean to you. Right. It's the unseen enemy that's influencing these people. Yeah. And it changes how you pray once you yeah. understand that. Angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. There's angels over churches. There's a whole list of those. I just put one, but Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3 you talk about that. Okay. And here's the verse, Jude verse 6. I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them. He gave them territorial limits and they went outside the boundaries. One example is the angels who, who in uh, Deuteronomy 6, who had sex with human women and they created the Nephilim. That's one of the problems. They stepped outside the boundaries. They were not allowed to do that. And those may be some of the ones in prison that is being talked about here. That's what some of the commentaries discuss. So, think about this from 1 Corinthians 10. I'm going to show it to you in four versions. Three or four, I can't remember. And, and uh, this is the reason Bible stories, we talked about the woman who touched Jesus' hymn. We talked about holding up Moses' arms to beat the Amalekites. So these prayer plus action things have a purpose. These stories are <laughs> illustrations to us today of how God has worked in the past. They're also examples of for us, according to the New Living Translation. And then in the in the New Century, they happen to teach us. Teach us what? To do similar things like stake your property. See? To pray and anoint with oil. See? These are, these are examples for us to learn from. To teach, illustrate examples. So we can know to go and do likewise. So when you hear somebody say, well, Steve's pulling stuff out of Scripture, you can tell them how many Scriptures I've showed you in every presentation. There's hundreds of verses in each presentation that I show you. Uh, and of course, our authority to bind and loose comes from Matthew 18, 18 and Matthew 16, 19. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth. So what I speak in the seen happens in the unseen. I bind the enemy. I loose healing and forgiveness and love. Because our words have power. God's so powerful, He spoke the world into existence. Guess what? We're children of God. Our words have power too. He gave us, and I mentioned this this morning, authority over all the power of the enemy. We need to learn to walk in that authority, to exercise that authority. I think spiritual warfare requires strategic thinking, and we're not used to thinking strategic. We're all lovey-dovey grace, and we don't talk about a real enemy that's, that's killing our kids. Okay? So I would say it like this. More often than not, Spiritual warfare is a complicated, integrated process of separating normal, good, wholesome daily activities from unwholesome ones. One way you could say that is, if I'm a Christian, i got the Holy Spirit, and I start looking at pornography, what do you think the Holy Spirit in me is going to do when I start looking at pornography? Because He's not staying with me. He's going to have to go, oh, Steve, 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 if you're going to do that, i got to go over here. And the more often I do that, the further the Holy Spirit gets from me. And then, before you know it, I can't hear Him because I'm too far away from Him. These little choices turn into bigger bad choices that end up in hell because we've opened ourselves up. Hope that makes sense. Remember that Jesus gave Peter the authority to walk on water 
And he did walk on water because of that authority that he gave him. And then he couldn't continue walking that authority. He focused on his fear instead of his faith. And that's when he sank. He could have walked as far as Jesus walked if he had focused on his faith. But he quit walking in his authority. There was a... We're going to talk about symbols now. I got a text one day from Connecticut. I don't even know how they got my number. I don't know anybody in Connecticut. It's funny how this spreads. But this, this text had a picture of a vase similar to this one. I couldn't find the actual picture. Uh, and uh, it had a question. And the, the vase was a maybe a 12-inch brown vase with a white design on the front. And the question said, hey, this vase came from Honduras. And ever since I read your book, What Are the Stakes? I've been worried that this symbol let something evil into my house for fixing the cover symbols. And she said, uh, look at this vase on the this symbol. Do I need to destroy this vase? I texted her right back and I said, I don't have a clue. I don't know what that is. But you know what? God does. Ask Him. Pray about it. And they texted back, you know, duh, we should have thought of that. So they prayed about it. And they said, Lord, please show us if it's evil. And if we need to destroy it to honor you, just let us know. We're glad to do that. We, they were just uncomfortable after they with the thought about this idea of symbols letting evil be connected in their own. So they prayed. And later I heard the whole story. 30 minutes after they prayed, they get a phone call from some friends at church. And the friend said, hey, meet us for supper. We've got some friends we want you to meet from ours, of ours who are from out of town. So they went. Guess where the friends were from? Honduras. Who would have guessed? <laughs> they said, oh, you're from Honduras. I just took this picture of this vase from Honduras. They showed it on the camera and the lady goes, I hate to tell you this, but that symbol on that vase represents a local demon god in Honduras. You really need to destroy that vase. Forty-five minutes after they prayed about it, they had their answer. You think God's not anxious to let you know when you have something in your home? Pray and ask God what's in your home that has a symbol on it you didn't realize was evil. Maybe that's why you're having nightmares. Maybe that's why your kids are having and grandkids are having nightmares. Maybe that's why you've got fear in your life. The enemy is promoting fear because it displaces faith. Right. See? Okay. That's a real pivotal story, and this one is just as pivotal. A former witch called me one day. She said, I was a witch for 20 years. I, made, I raised my kids while I was a witch. They're all messed up. But I'm a baptized believer in Jesus now, and so is my husband. Can I send him by your house to get some steaks? I said, well, sure. She comes by, and they get the steaks. They get the instruction sheet. Next morning at 7 a.m., my phone rang. I was getting ready to shave because, you know, I was, I was headed out to shave and go eat breakfast somewhere and do my Bible study reading. And I uh, said, hello. And they said, we've been up all night. We waited until 7 to call you. I said, well, thank you because I wouldn't have remembered anything about that if you'd called me in the middle of the night. And they said... You know, uh, we, we staked out the house and followed your instructions. We don't know if we did something wrong because we did all that. And then at midnight, doors started slamming. The door, windows started rattling. There were noises in the attic. And, you know, I was a witch. I know what it was. It's, it was demonic. Did we do something wrong? And I said, no, you didn't do anything wrong. But that happens if you still have something in your home that dishonors God or honors Satan. And immediately she goes, oh, my goodness, I still have all my books on witchcraft. I said, well, you need to burn those. She said, oh, you're right. right. In, in Galatians and Ephesians, there's more than one place where they're burning millions of dollars worth of, of uh, books on magic and witchcraft and all that. So they burned them. But certain pages wouldn't burn. So they took those pages and cut them up into little bitty pieces, put them in a sack, and buried them off the property somewhere. Two weeks later, exactly the same happened. Midnight, doors slamming, noises in the attic, the same exact thing, all night long. They were up all night again. I learned then that demons don't always go back to the same house each night. They may have a route. They may go to your house, then yours, and yours, and yours, and Two weeks later, they're back to yours. I, that's kind of what I'm learning. I'm just learning. I'm watching what God does and trying to learn from it. So uh, they called me at 7 and they said, okay, it happened again last night, exactly like before. What's the next step? Now, I want you to know, at this point, I didn't have a next step. But immediately, I knew what to say. <laughs> the Holy Spirit just kind of helps you. You just kind of learn to depend on Him. I said, just like I've done it every day, I said, oh, the next step is, you need to kneel by your bed tonight and pray and ask God to show you what's still there. I think you missed something. Or there was something hidden on the property you didn't know about, buried in the floor, hidden in the attic. I have actually found floor joists under the floor with satanic symbols on them. 
I've crawled under a house before and scratched them off and, and written Bible verses instead. They're leaving symbols. They're burying crystals around the courthouse in Tyler two months ago. Look on Facebook. There's a Facebook group burying crystals. You think the enemy doesn't know that symbols are important? They know. So I told her, pray about it and ask God to show you what's still there so you can destroy it to honor Him. So they did. They knelt by the bed that night, her and her husband, they prayed, and she had a dream. And in the dream, she saw that, that uh, uh, a couch in the guest bedroom, which she saw it raise up in the air about three feet and then just fall back down. And then it raised up again, fell down all night long, up, down, up, down, up, down. So the next morning, you know, you don't always remember your dreams, do you? She remembered this one. She runs in that room and said, maybe there's something in there. She found one more book on witchcraft that was under that couch. That's how she found it, because of a dream. You think God can't use dreams? Right. I will say He can. They burned it. Everything stopped. Next thing you know, I'm doing this seminar at their biker church. So You can't make this stuff up. Okay. Symbols matter, so clean up your house. Now, I'm going to do, and we're going to talk in there about the importance of symbols, and I'm going to play a little game with you, and I'm going to put a series of symbols on the screen, and I want you to out loud answer the first thing you think of when you see that symbol. Ready? <coughs> okay, now where's the verse that says a horseshoe is good luck, by the way? It's not in the Bible. If you're hanging up a horseshoe for good luck, it's a symbol for evil. If it's just a horseshoe, you got horseshoes here. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're counting on it, it's like a rabbit's foot. See? There's, I, did a, I did a podcast on that too. Okay? I would have said sausage McGriddle, but that's okay. We know these symbols, don't we? And the enemy's trying to steal some of these symbols. I used to have a rabbit's foot on my car. If you've got a rabbit's foot for good luck, burn it. It's letting the enemy in. We all know the Playboy Bunny symbol. Now, the next generation may not because it's not as big as it used to be. I have a story about the Playboy Bunny. A preacher of a large church in East Texas called me into his office and we sat down and he said, I think God wants me to tell you this story so you can help people with this one. He said, my dad was a Green Beret and he was also a very spiritual and godly man. And as a family, our prayer time each day was at the dinner table each evening. We would, we would eat and we would talk about all the people we need to pray for. You know, Aunt Betty's got cancer and cousin Janet has this, and we would make a list. So he said, I was nine when this happened, but my dad added to the list. His dad said, I sense an evil presence in our home that hasn't been here before, so we're going to add that to the list. Evil presence. And my friend Glenn said, I was nine. I didn't know what he was talking about. But we prayed about it. Next day, same thing. Prayed about it again. Third day, same thing. Fourth day, Glenn came home from school and it was early afternoon, and he was sitting on his bed doing homework. And uh, his dad came home early from the base. And he comes into Glenn's bedroom and says, Hey, Glenn, you doing your homework? I said, Yeah, Dad. And he said, Glenn, what's this on your shelf right up here? And Glenn said his best friend liked to buy those, uh, remember where you could buy those models and super glue the pieces together like a jet or a car or something, and then you'd put them on a little pedestal and you could display it. You know? Well, his friend Billy loved to do that. He had a it was like an F-16 or some real hiked up jet. And, and you know, he, he already had one like that, so he gave this one to Glenn after he put it together. He said, well, my friend Glenn, uh, my friend Billy gave me that. That's an F-16. And his dad said, yeah, I know, but what's these stickers on it? And Glenn said, he got up and looked at it and said, well, Dad, that's an Army and Navy and Air Force and a Marine sticker. He said, yeah, I know what those are. What's this one on the tail? And, and Glenn said, I don't know. What is it, Dad? And it was that. And his dad said, Glenn, I know what that symbol represents. And it's a group of people trying to break up families and yeah. pull people away from God. And the fact that we're displaying that in our home lets the enemy's presence into our home. Yeah. Glenn said, I was nine. All I could think was, he's fixing to take my gin. 
But his dad said, well, I'll tell you what, man. Let me, let's go out on the porch. We'll give you my pocket knife, and you can scratch that symbol off. And I'll take you to the dime store, buy you any sticker you want, and you can replace it. Would that be okay? And Glenn said, yeah, Dad, that way I can keep my jet. And Glenn said, I never forgot that. And the next day when we prayed, his dad said, we can mark that off the list that evil presence is not here anymore. And he said, I never forgot that. He said, Steve, seven years ago I moved to this town. I didn't even know you. I never heard about your stuff. The first thing I did was stake my property. With Bible verses on 10 states. And three years ago I bought another house and moved. And the first thing I did before I moved in was I staked my property. With Bible verses on 10 states. I never even met him then. This is more than a ministry. It's a movement of God. I think he's tired of Satan taking the land. And this is a way we can mark it off and take it back. Hope that makes sense. Okay. So Satan has links and lures in the physical to try to pull us away from God. Tarot cards. I have a podcast on this. They don't tell the future. Only God knows the future. This is why prophecy is in the Bible. Revelation 19.10 says, The essence of prophecy is to be a witness for Jesus Christ. How, how do we prove Jesus is the Messiah? He fulfilled the prophecies. Now think about that for a second. There's about 119 first coming prophecies. There's about 330 second coming prophecies. So when I'm doing my heaven book, I started studying that. I said, well, wait a minute. I want to see how many of the first coming prophecies are literal versus symbolic so that I'll know how many of the second coming prophecies that talk about eternity with God in heaven, see what percentage of them is literal. And I'm, I'm actually thinking it's 50-50. Okay, let's go back. The first coming prophecies, are they literal or symbolic? Let is a lamb to slaughter. Okay, that's the symbol, right? But he was literally slaughtered. So technically that would be literal. Name me a symbolic only prophecy on the first coming. Born of a virgin. Hands and feet pierced. Rise in three days. Betrayed by a friend. Thirty pieces of silver. Buried a rich man too. Not a bone broken. They're all literal. That's how we prove Jesus is the Messiah. So when any professor, I don't care how many credentials they got behind the name, and say all the, all the uh, prophecies had to fulfilled, they're all symbolic. I'm going to question that. Because God's pattern is literal. What do they do with false prophets? You remember? Anybody remember? You're supposed to stone them. So if, I couldn't come into town and say, hey, I'm Prophet Steve. And if y'all don't repent in sackcloth and ashes, by next Tuesday at 2 o'clock, fire from heaven is going to rain down and you're all going to be dead. Okay? So nobody repents. Next Tuesday, it's 2.01. You've got your rock and you're looking for me because I'm a false prophet. And that's the right thing to do. But the one thing I could never do to defend myself is say, oh, symbolically it happened. You're all dead don't know it. I saw the fire. Y'all didn't see it? <laughs> How are you supposed to stone a false prophet unless what they teach literally comes true or not? When you symbolize the Bible away, then it's, it doesn't mean anything anymore. You can mean it whatever you want. That's the danger in not trusting God's Word. I think that's why He's blessed what I'm doing. I'm nobody, not given what you're seeing this week in 300 cities and 27 states and 3 countries. I'm nobody. God uses nobodies all the time. And everybody here can reach somebody for the kingdom that nobody else can reach. Amen. We all have somebody we can get to. About the about what now? Ask me what it's something the Bible. Right after that, I missed what you said. Did you record it? Because I don't know exactly what I said. Did anybody know what I said? Nobody else. I don't remember. The Bible means what it says. It's literal. Okay. All right. Uh, rabbit's foot can't bring good luck. Palm reading. These symbols. Uh, a medium. Don't go visit a medium. The Bible says that specifically. By the way, they have power. I know people who've gone and said, Mama, hid money in the house. Where is it? And they go, oh, it's under the sink. There's a hidden door. And they go find it. And they're Christians. The enemy has power. It's from the wrong place. And it's designed to deceive you. And he wants you to have all the money. He wants you to be after money. So he's sure going to help you with that. Dream catchers. And I had one hanging from my rearview mirror. Go look what a dream catcher is supposed to do for you. Look it up. Go to Wikipedia. I did a podcast on this recently. I can't see the number there. 59 or something. Y'all can read it up there. Jason, what's the number of the podcast on that one? 99. 99. Podcast 99. And we talk about dream catchers. Dream catchers, according to Wikipedia, are designed to filter out bad dreams 
and only let good dreams through. So you want protection in the night from bad dreams from somebody besides God because there's not a Bible yeah, verse for it. That means it's from the enemy. So burn your dream catchers. I didn't know this was a problem until I had a young lady who the day she was baptized on a Sunday, she's a senior in high school, she told her mama she wanted to be a missionary's wife, she was going to major in missions. She goes home and they stake their property and immediately she has terrifying nightmares all night. She'd never had a bad dream in her life. And her mom said, but she does have three dream catchers over her headboard. And they burned them and never had another problem. That's when I learned this is an issue. God just keeps putting me in the middle of other people's stories. And I'm just a story collector. That's all it is. Horoscopes, same thing. It's not from God. One, one uh, Christian lady I know bought crystals off the internet that was supposed to bring good luck. It made things worse. It invites the enemy in because there's not a Bible verse for that. If you've got a Bible verse for it, you're on the right track. If you don't, I would question it. Investigate it. Pornography is the biggest industry on the planet. That's a big problem. Pentagrams, those symbols. Uh, Ouija boards, if any of those have a pentagram on them somewhere. Uh, Reiki healing. I, I had a lady a friend me from England, and we did a Facebook uh, video call or whatever, and she was going to church all the time, and everything's great. She got into Reiki healing because she had a friend with back trouble and didn't heal the person. Next thing you know, this lady's having terrifying nightmares, seeing shadows in her room. She can't get any sleep. So I said, we'll stake your house. You know, I can't ship them to England, but you can make your own. Here's the document. Never had another problem. Satanic tattoos. Seances. Darkness. Cursed objects. Amulets and crystals. Go on the internet. I had one family in Northeast Texas. They heard me speak on this on a Sunday night, just like this, and uh, went home, and their daughter was 12. And she had just ordered an amulet on the internet that brings good luck and had given it to her daughter the day before. And then I preached on this. They went home and she and the daughter said, said, what do you think about the amulet now that Steve talked about symbols? And the, the daughter said, I think we need to get rid of it, even though it's brand new. And I was excited about it. I think we need to throw it away. So they threw it in the trash and took the trash out to the dumpster across the street. The next morning, they opened the door to leave. That amulet was laying right on the doorstep. It's a way for the enemy to get back in. And when you remove that way in, they're upset. And let me just throw out this. I'll talk later more about Michael Lehan. Michael Lehan is a guy from Edmond, Oklahoma, who friended me on Facebook. He was a Satanist for 22 years before he became a baptized believer in Jesus. And he says he had two assignments as a Satanist. Preacher, I hope you're listening to this, Tater. One of his main assignments was to go to Christian churches pretending to be a Christian so he could cause church splits. He was very good at it. Many people stake their building and certain people won't come back. That's usually a good thing. The second thing he did, and this takes Ephesians 6, strategies of the devil to a new level, he would go to stores and pray over items that Christians might someday purchase, asking his God Satan to attach a demon to that item. So if a Christian bought it, they'd have a way into the Christian's home. Sometimes they seem innocent. This is why, just like the vase, pray and ask God if you have something in your home that's been prayed over by the enemy. I had a, a couple that had been 30 years in missions in Africa. Come home with a bunch of souvenirs. I know you're going. Came home with a bunch of souvenirs. And now, every time they get sick, and they get sick with something else, and something else, back to back to back to back to back sicknesses. And they heard me talk, and they got rid of all that stuff, and immediately they both got well. There are a lot of curses attached to items that we buy as souvenirs or give to each other as good luck charms or just neat art. Ask God. He knows. You can say, well, I don't believe in demons. Well, you also could say, I don't believe in gravity. I'm just going to jump off this 10-story building. I think gravity is going to affect you whether you believe in it or not. Because the unseen realm is real. That's why this stuff is important to learn. That's why I think Taylor would agree. Every Christian should have to go through some spiritual warfare training because it's for such a time as this. Look around us. So, Christians have times of the unseen too. See, Satan's just mimicking what we have. We have the cross. We have the Lord's Supper. We have baptism. We have the Bible. By the way, the Bible is just simple. There's a, there's a verse that says, if everything Jesus did was recorded, the whole world couldn't contain all the books. 
You are a Bible study. I'm, I'm a Bible story. We're, we're living out Bible stories. That's all that was. Okay? It's the same thing. They're not, I mean, look at, look at all the mistakes they made. Do you make any? I mean, David killed and committed adultery, some of the real big ones. And yet he was still a man after God's own heart because of how he responded when he was confronted with his sin. A little different from Judas. Judas just killed himself. And David said, I've sinned. Forgive me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He understood repentance restores that relationship. See, God doesn't need our acts of faith to do great works. We need Him. Yeah. It reminds us He's in control. His Word is still important. It's still powerful. So I'm going to show you now some Bible verses that show demonic attachment to tangible objects. And some of these are going to really surprise you. This is why symbols are really important to understand that this is a big issue. First of all, 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says we need to avoid any sort of idolatry. I mean, I love golf, but golf can't be my idol. I can't skip church to play golf. You know, I have to prioritize what I like. Um, did you realize that in Leviticus 17, 7, and I'm going to show you a couple more, that when they were offering sacrifices to demons, idol, uh, to idols, demons were accepting those, those blood sacrifices. Did you know that? Here's Leviticus 17, 7 says it. Uh, uh, they were accepted by idols. And it also says it in 1 Corinthians 10, 19 and 20. When they were given food to idols, it was being accepted by demons. It was being offered to demons. If you Googled right now, food offered to idols, it happens all over the planet today. Buddha statues with a little tray. They put bananas. They'll give, uh, we, we work in Ghana. We have missionaries in Ghana. They have a little idol in every village. People go by and they kill a deer. They give it a hind quarter. They give it a bottle of beer. They open the bottle and sit it there. They give food to idols every day. Demons are accepting those food sacrifices. That's what the Bible says. The New Testament in the Bible says that. Okay? Uh, there's a demonic communion. A cup of demons and a table of demons. See, he's just mocking God. Uh, idol worship is demon worship. Revelation 9, verse 20. They continued to worship demons made of gold. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 28-30 says that we need to examine ourselves before we eat the bread and drink the cup. That's why some of you are sick and others have died. Now, how many times have you heard of the communion table when they did a Lord's Supper presentation they said, by the way, focus on what you're doing because if not, you're going to bring sickness and death on yourself. But that's what the New Testament says. Go read it. Go read it. In whatever version you like, Read 1 Corinthians 11, 28-30. That's why many of you are sick and some have died. It's a serious thing. When you're taking the Lord's Supper, you better not be thinking about what time the kickoff is. You better be focused on what, is, what this is about and the sacrifice that He gave for us. This also in Psalm 106 says that when they sacrifice their sons and daughters, uh, they sac by sacrificing to idols. Now, how many of y'all have know the term in the Bible, they made their son or daughter pass through the fire. Raise your hand if you know that term. Very few know that term. I know Taylor knows it. it. It's a term that means, here's what passing through the fire means. Molech was an iron idol with the head of a bull and the body of a human. And he was seated on a throne with his hands stretched out. So when you're seated on the throne, your hands stretched out, your hands are you're right over your knees. And they built a fire. You can't see it real good, but there's a fire between his feet, and it's getting the hands hotter and hotter. So they go to they go to church and they'd have temple prostitutes. That's a nice word for saying they went to church and had sex with someone that wasn't their spouse. Can you imagine having side rooms here at the church and just that's what they were doing? And by the way, that's why God said, kill them all, men, women, and children. There's no penicillin back then. They're spreading venereal disease like crazy. Kill them all. It wasn't because God hates the women and children. They're all diseased because they go to church and have sex with anybody. They were having group orgies. I don't mean to be gross, but that's what was going on. Then at the height of the worship, I don't know if you can hardly see it, but the man that's standing there in front of the idol has his newborn baby boy. And as the hands on the idol get hotter and hotter from the fire, iron begins to turn white before it melts. So they would take their newborn baby boy and get as close as they could stand from the heat and pinch the baby. That's what he's about to do, is to pinch the baby over into those white hot arms and the baby would scream and melt and die and they would celebrate. All right, now we're going to have a good economy and make a lot of money and have good crops. <laughs> kind of like abortion in modern day. Go read uh, 
Return of the Gods by Jonathan Kahn. We'll talk about that on Wednesday. So that's the evil that was going on. They were making their son pass through the fire. If you had a daughter, okay, but it's better to have a son. Because see, Molech and Baal, they control the weather and the economy. So if we appease them with blood sacrifices, then we'll have a good economy. That's what's going on. Next time you see that word in Scripture, made their son pass through the fire, you'll understand it. Okay, Genesis 35, they had pagan earrings. That means pagan symbols on earrings, kind of like a dream catcher thing. And so it was, look what it says it was doing. This is Genesis 35. It was, it was uh, God was telling them to get rid of it out of Jacob's family. Then go to Ezekiel 13, 18. They had magic charms on their wrists and magic veils. And it says the charms honored other gods. You tie magic charms and wrists to furnish them with magic veils. And then that same verse says that the charms that honor other gods lead to sorrow. And then get this, destruction. And it traps the souls of the people. Can a symbol trap a soul? That's what the Bible says. Ensnaring the souls of my people, these magic charms on their wrists and magic veils over their head. The people were being deceived, saying, that's no big deal. Steve's stupid to say a symbol makes a difference. I'm just telling you what the Bible said. You can believe it or not. There used to be a bumper sticker that says, God, believe it. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. See, I think it's wrong. I think it should have said, God said it. That settles it, whether I believe it or not. Because the Bible says it was ensnaring their souls. And it sets God against you. Symbols you allow in your home. Playboys. Porn. Uh, I had one guy that told me the days he looked at porn, he realized that was the nights his kids had nightmares. And that helped him stop looking at porn because he realized he wasn't just hurting himself. He was hurting his own children. That gave him the courage to stop. <coughs> they imprison believers. They ensnare you. Ezekiel 13, verse 20. So it says it in verse 18. says it again in verse 20. Look at Ezekiel 13 in your Bible. It also says in Isaiah 57 that those pagan symbols often had naked bodies. Pornography is not a new problem. Isaiah was written a very long time ago. Symbols show partnership with God's enemies. Pagan symbols you climb, shows you climbed into bed with these detestable gods. Little g gods. That's what's going on. Now, I had a lady I sat by on an airplane. When I go on a plane to fly to somewhere to speak, I always pray, well, God, if there's somebody I need to meet, well, put me by them so we can talk. And it usually happens. Well, this one time I sat down and going to Ohio, and this lady sat beside me, and I'm buckling up, and she said, sir, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a Christian author, and I teach on spiritual warfare. She said, really? She said, my dad is a pastor. And few months ago, he got on a plane to fly somewhere, and when he sat down, the guy sat right beside him, had his eyes closed, he was bent over in his seat, his hands were folded, and his lips were moving. It was obvious he was praying. So she said, my dad let him finish, and then he sat up, started buckling up, and my dad turned to him and said, it looks like you're a praying man. Can I ask what you're praying for? And he looked at him and said, I'm praying to my God, Satan, that Christianity in America can be wiped out by destroying the marriages of all the pastors and preachers. That's what I'm praying for. Yeah. The enemy is praying against Taylor. The enemy is praying against your preacher. Right. We need to be praying for protection. That's right. And they're getting bold about it. Did you watch the Golden Globes the other day? One of the, one of the uh, uh, network executives uh, tweeted, time to worship. Who do you think they're worshiping? And he got a lot of flack. They deleted it after a few hours, but people screenshot it. Time to worship. They are worshiping the enemy. They're getting blatant with it. Now, I want to, I want to wind up, and then we'll have some questions here. Wind up on this little, I want you to see what Beverly wrote. Beverly posted verses, and her depression disappeared. I got the stakes. I was very excited to get moving. I spent much time in prayer and have purged some things from my house. That's what we were talking about. I'm preparing to destroy this oppression, ready for it to be over. Thank you for your role in this. I had invited some family to come participate, so I felt angry and abandoned when none of them showed up. My faith was weak, wondering if God had made me a laughing stock like a court jester. But some friends came. 
we met, prayed, and stayed to my place. It was excruciating. I started with confessing when I had let a demon into my life by giving God an ultimatum. I, hate, I had hated God for my abusive, adulterous husband and for my own weaknesses. I confessed my anger and lack of forgiveness toward many people. My friends provided strong support and encouragement. We circled my coffee table and prayed for, what you pray for? Protection, wisdom, strength, the ability to forgive, and humility. I was shaking almost violently the entire time. I put stakes in the wall of every room. I never heard of that before. She put them in the wall and by both sides of the entrance to her apartment. I put a prayer card in my wallet and another under my mattress. That night was the worst. A demon of despair attacked me with one last desperate stand. I wanted to die. I prayed through the entire experience until I actually passed out from exhaustion. I woke the next morning with a peace that exceeded anything I've ever felt. I binged on things I had ceased to enjoy. Baking, cleaning out, painting, and making gifts for friends. It is gone. Friends were messaging me asking how I was doing, but I turned off my phone, not wanting to respond until I was sure this was permanent. I have had no more nightmares, no more attacks, no more despair. I painted a picture for a friend and scriptures of protection on it. Once my own situation was resolved, two others came to me with similar problems. They are being attacked in much the same ways. Our preacher wants to keep stakes and some of your books at the church. We're convinced this is going to open minds and doors to the true reason for so much sorrow in people's lives, and we want to be prepared. Thank you, Steve, for being a conduit for God for all your help. But that was her message. I met her later, and, and I, I evaluated. Think about the, the things she did to set the stage to overcome depression. She had severe depression. Look at what she did to overcome that. She, she was getting moving. She got the stakes. She was ready for it to be over. Uh, and then she said, I felt angry and abandoned. None of them showed up. So she was feeling depressed and alone. And she started with confessing. She let a demon into her life, the last line up there. And then she got the stakes and uh, uh, prayer and preparing for the oppression to be over and invited family and friends to come. So she she included her friends. She needed, you know, the Bible says, you know, two are better than one and three is a strong cord. Get somebody to go stake with you. You know, don't do it alone. Don't face the enemy alone. And so then her friends were encouraged and encircled the coffee table, shaking violently. And then she put God's Word all around and, and it was gone. I just finished a children's book. And we're going to call it Dante's Harry Scary Dream. Because everywhere I go, I find out that kids tell their parents, I've been having nightmares for years, I just never told you. Kids are reluctant to share this. So I designed this little book. Uh, you know, People kept saying, oh, you write a children's book on spiritual warfare. I said, that's too hard. I don't know how to do that. And then I was coming back. I spoke at the state capitol in Austin recently. We staked out the state capitol, wrote you know, issues on it like honesty and integrity and stuff. And I spoke in the rotunda. And I went back from that. So I went back from that. Uh, God just kind of gave me a download. He said, oh, you seem to do it like this. It's not hard. And I went, oh, that is easy. So it's a simple little story about Dante, who, you know, his mama prays with him and tucks him in every night. And one night he has a hairy, scary dream. And he didn't want to tell her because it's too scary. And then a couple days later, he has another one and another one. He finally tells her, and she says, let's just pray because prayer is powerful. And they pray. And she said, now we're going to put some verses around your bedroom. And he said, well, how's that going to help? God's word is powerful. So they do that, and then he has a dream and sees an angel standing in all four corners of his room. The end. Simple little story, but it's designed to get kids to open up and tell their parents when they're having bad dreams so you can deal with it early so that the legba thing doesn't happen to you. So the funny thing, it's funny how God's provide. So I don't I don't have an illustrator. I've just done wordy books. I haven't ever done picture books. So I put it on Facebook and had 40 people volunteer to help with it. And one of them was a college friend who's a famous artist. His paintings are five to 10,000 a piece. And he called and said, I want to do this. And I'll do it with you. He's, I'm meeting him for lunch Tuesday to talk about it in Cleburne. He lives in Dallas. So you can't make this stuff up. But when God endorses something, he provides what you need. Amen. So pray about that. Uh, it's, it's eight. I want to stop. Any questions anybody wants to ask before we end with the closing prayer? What if God, like uh, a family member, like you're doing this thing, Maybe a quarter or something, and they hold on to that object, and they don't believe what you're 
take them out and say, can you still go behind their back and stake it anyway? She's got a great question. She's asking, what if you're talking to somebody about this and they say, well, I don't believe that makes a difference. First of all, I can only, God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children. So I can't make somebody else believe. And I can only make me do the right thing. But what I would suggest in a situation like that is say to them, okay, you're having nightmares, and I'm telling you, it might be this, this uh, souvenir that's this mask that you got in Africa. So why don't we do this? Let's put it in a box, and we're going to put stakes in each corner of the box. So it's, it's, you know, you're imprisoning if there's anything attached to it. And then see if you have a nightmare. Don't be afraid to put God's Word on the line. Uh, I remember when, when uh, the, the year after, we, we stayed Longview every year. One year we said no suicide. One year we said no witchcraft. We do different things. And the police chief knew that crime had dropped 45%. And I went to him and said, would you do a video with me to promote people coming to help us stake this year? We're going we're gonna to talk about no suicide. And he said, well, what are you going to do if the suicide don't go down? And I said, I'm not scared to put God's Word on the line. Right. It's not me at risk. We're praying. We're asking God for what we want. By the way, you may ask God for something and He may say no, right? Okay. What if it's kind of like my son is going to go to college. And I say, okay, son, I'm going to buy you a car to go to college. What would you like? He'd say, Corvette. And I'd say, no, maybe Chevette. No Corvette. Now, it's not, it wouldn't be good for him to have a Corvette. I mean, for a first car, especially, you know. Okay, but on top of that, do I love my son less because he asked for a Corvette? No way. So if I ask God to show His power and heal, and He does something different than I expect, there's no skin off my back. He doesn't, he doesn't love anybody any less. I, I often say, when I grew up in a, in a little church in Central Texas, uh, we would have Brother Smith would be sick. And we'd say, get up and pray. Dear God, Brother Smith is sick. Be with him. God's probably saying, I'm with him. And he's sick. What do you really want? What do you want me to do? Oh, oh, well then uh, would, would you heal him? Ask me. Just ask me. He's not going to do what we don't ask him. So then I say, okay, well please, please heal Brother Smith. Now one of two things is going to happen. He's either going to die and go to heaven because he's Brother Smith. Or he's going to get well. If he gets well, I say, praise God. If he dies and goes to heaven, do I say, there is no God? No. I change my prayer because his family misses him, I changed my prayer. But if Brother Smith is in heaven and he say, Hey, Brother Smith, you want to go back or stay here? What do you think he'd vote for? <laughs> so we don't let it affect our faith. We change our prayers based on what we see happen. Ask God how to lead you through a situation like that. As an example, and by the way, I hear this a lot. What, how can I stick you up in my daughter's home? She won't even talk to us. I know her address. She lives in Minnesota, but she won't even speak to us. Go to Google Maps. Print out her address from above, and you got a picture of her house on a piece of paper. Put that piece of paper in a box and put four stakes in the corner of that box and stake her out by remote control and watch if something that happens. Mail her a picture of the family you know she'll keep and hide verses on the back of the picture before you put the back cover on it. You're staking out their house, they don't even know it. I've had people hide. Let me tell you a teacher story and then we'll stop. I had a teacher in East Texas at a big district that the you know how they sometimes they want you to, to quit so they put you in a bad job so you'll hate it and leave okay that's pretty common so they moved her to third grade she never taught third grade and they gave her the worst third graders in this big district and so she called me and she said okay they, they're trying to get me to leave but i'm just going to show them the power of god's word come help me stake my room so we put stakes actually put them in the ceiling tile above the ceiling tile four corners nobody could find them or see them or anything and then she said what else can we do i'm going to do something else and I said, well, I don't know. Why don't we take these red plastic cards with the same verses and get a piece of duct tape and tape one under every desk in the room? She said, oh, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So we did. And that year, in that district, 35% of the third graders passed the basic skills test. But her class had 85%. And they had given her the worst third graders. It, it was so dramatic a change. Other teachers accused her of cheating. And there was no evidence. It didn't go anywhere. But that's how angry they were. They were trying to get her to quit. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll be around if you want to ask any other quiet and prescans, but we probably, it's after 8. I don't, want to, I, don't want to, I don't want to be in the habit too bad if you know too late. Let me end with a prayer. I'll hang around and then we'll be back again tomorrow night at 7. Father God, thank you so much for this day and for all these people who've come 
to draw closer to you and to learn how to pray with more power to make a difference for our loved ones. Uh, I pray you give everybody a safe trip home and that you would touch our hearts and help us to realize who we need to be praying for and how we need to approach this and, and help us to all to remember these are not formulas that require you to do anything. These are ideas of success stories. They're testimonies that make a difference in people's lives and help us to have encouragement and hope for the loved ones we are praying for. We love you and we look forward to the day we can see you face to face. Until then, help us to serve you faithfully and wholeheartedly. We pray that you would continue the revival. We've seen you start in certain parts of the country and colleges. Let it spread to the whole country and the whole world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you all. See you tomorrow. Thank you.